Well, howdy once again, everybody. Uh, I am Al Longoria with Longoria House Dog Training in Houston, Texas. Hey, thanks for joining me tonight. Um, in this format, what we're going to do is I've got a list of questions that I've received uh, during the week from clients, from people that we meet, uh, from folks like you. Uh, but what I'm going to be doing is going to be I'm going to be going over those questions um, and answering those in as much or as little detail as you need. Uh, but hey, we're always here to help you. Really appreciate each and every one of you guys that's watching this. Um, and I've done a couple of new things that I want to bring up before I go into my first topic. Um, so for those of you guys, if this is your first time meeting me, hey, thanks so much. I'm very honored that you would uh, give me your attention. But if you're watching this on Facebook, um, what we've done is now we've gonna, we're going to have a playlist that has all of my past Q&As that you're going to be able to just go back and watch. So if you go into the video section, I think on your mobile device or even on your computer, you're going to see some of our playlists and we've put all of our new play, uh, all of our uh, these shows, the question and answer shows on there. So you can definitely find questions that you're looking for. And if you can't find what you're looking for, hey, send me a request and I'd love to go over it uh, during this. So I'm just going to do a couple things, make sure that everything is sounding great. Um, but uh, I appreciate all you guys. It was nice having the week off last week. Uh, but I'm glad to be back and be able to be able to do this. I've got quite a few questions actually tonight. I've got uh, I've got you know front and back of a page, so probably that's somewhere in the vicinity of 15 questions. So that's that's quite a few. So hey, to all my friends that are watching, hey guys, really appreciate y'all uh, tuning in tonight. Hey, can I ask a favor? Can you go over down to that share icon and share this? Uh, it means a lot to me when you guys do this. Uh, but hey, appreciate every, each and every one of you guys. All right, let's make sure the live stream is good on, on my iPad. And, oh, there it is. Great. I'm going to go ahead and open that up so I can watch it. Hey, Dustin, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Hope to see you, hope to see you soon uh, at practice again. So, all right, so the, uh, the first thing that I want to go over tonight is something that, yeah, it's an important topic. Um, is a pit bull a safe dog? You know, a lot of there's a lot of rumors out there, or a lot of uh, hysteria, really, over the breed and what they are. So uh, let me start with this. Uh, the very simple answer is to the question of this: Are pit bulls safe? Yes, they are. They are safe dogs. Okay. Now, that's also just as safe as your kitchen knife that's in your kitchen. It's a very safe thing if you know how to use it. A pit bull can be a very powerful dog. They're very smart. And they do have some tendencies that if their owners don't know about them can really set them up, um, you know, for some really, uh, really kind of dangerous things. But that really goes with any, for any dog. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me all that well, I have German Shepherds. Uh, my German Shepherds are protection trained dogs. And so that's kind of a scary thing for some people. But really, you know, understanding who the dog is and developing them is that. So when it comes to pit bulls, they're pretty safe dogs. All the ones that we've dealt with over the years have really been just these very cuddly, very sweet, very smart, and very prey-driven dogs. So I just think that it's important that if you're the owner of a pit bull, uh, that you actually go through some training, okay? And the training is going to have to teach your dog how to have some self-control, now, what I'm going to say next shouldn't be a surprise to any of you guys that have uh, that have been following me for any time, but any dog that gets excited, that's where all the bad, unwanted behaviors that you know that we don't want, that's where they are on the other side of excitement. So a pit bull can be a very powerful dog, and when it gets excited, okay, there are some things that we need to be sure that we're helping them understand that hey, you need to de-escalate your excitement, but you also need to make sure with your pit bull that you're regularly exercising them, I mean, on a daily basis, sometimes two or three times a day to manage this high prey drive dog. So it is a really great dog and they're very, very safe, but making sure that you're educated, you know the breed, that you're working with them, that you're stimulating their mind, that you're doing things like that is really going to help you to make sure that these kinds of dogs really are safe. But I'll tell you again, from my experience from dealing with them, um, very sweet, great temperaments. It's an intelligent dog and it does have a lot of prey drive. 
On a side note, uh, talking about pit bulls, the most dangerous dog that I've ever worked with wasn't a pit bull. I wouldn't even, like, we deal with a lot of dogs that are, are dangerous, and, you know, I don't think I've ever dealt with a pit bull that's all that dangerous. I've seen some that are very powerful, but when you, uh, when you explain to them and you care about them and you show them affection and you show them boundaries, those dogs train the same as any other dog. So hope that is helpful for you guys. Pit bulls, safe breed, love them, and uh, maybe someday I'll own one. I don't know. I love my German Shepherds. You know me, guys. All right. So um, first question that I have that's at the top of the list. And hey, and any of you guys that have questions at any point, feel free to drop, you know, to drop that down in the comment section below. I'd love to answer your questions live. Um, but if you're just here for that, hey, uh, here from the other questions that I'm receiving, hey, really appreciate you. If you just joined us, go down, hit that share button, let your friends know that the live stream has started. So what is the technique of flooding? Okay, so what is the technique of flooding and how is that beneficial and what are the pitfalls? So flooding is a technique, okay, that you basically get the dog into a situation, okay, and there is a ton of stimulus. Yes, that is a very general kind of answer, but let me give you one situation that I flood a dog. The very first time that I teach your dog its play stay or its down stay, I get the dog's favorite food, I put the dog into the down, and I flood the dog with reward. And what I mean is it's gonna be you know, food for 20 or 30 seconds petting for 20 to 30, 40 seconds. And then it's also going to be uh, my praise continuously going during this, during this very intense but very pleasurable moment. There are other types of floods, okay? Another form of flooding, um, which I don't, when I don't agree with, but I wanna show you because I've seen videos that are out there. There could be, let's say that you have a pack of dogs, like there's five or six dogs, they're with their handlers, they're on a training collar, like a prong collar and, a, and, a, and the leash, and then somebody takes a row of black cats, throws those out there and lights them, and the black cats just go you know, off, and the dogs are freaking out. That's flooding too. That's a bad form of flooding. Okay, so there's some that are kind of in between and you have to really know your dog to understand like, hey, is this a technique that's gonna help? So I actually recommended flooding to a family today for their dog that jumps a lot. We've made a ton, a ton of headway with this dog that hey, he really understands that he's not supposed to jump but he still has some problems. These folks wanna get him around a ton of people. So what I recommended to them in conjunction with their leash training, I want them to actually catch the end of a sports game, like go to a Rockets game, go to Memorial Park, go to a place where there's a ton of people moving in a crowd. And since they've been working on their leash walking for several weeks now, get the dog and start walking in this pack of people. And I'm gonna tell you when the dog is in that situation, especially this particular dog, it's going to be very, very beneficial for the dog. And it's going to be like, okay, I'm around all these people. Practically everybody is ignoring me. I know what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And then the dog is going to really learn very rapidly from that circumstance. But you do, gotta, you do have to be careful when flooding with anything that could potentially be an aversive or high amounts of pressure. So flooding with black cats, don't do that. Flooding your uh, human aggressive dog as step one with a whole bunch of people, not a good idea either. But hey, flooding your dog with food, petting and praise for sitting by your left hand side the first time that you're teaching them that, that's a pretty awesome way to go about doing that. So just think about that. If you're kind of at a, in a place that hey, your dog already understands what it is that you wanna do, uh, like leash walking, putting them into a group of people and practicing your short and slack leash walking in those scenarios could be very beneficial for you and your dog. All right, guys, so I've got the next question, okay? Hey, and if you're just joining in right now, why don't you go down, hit that share button, let your friends know, I'd really appreciate it, okay? All right, so, I, you know, I get this question a lot. This is the specific question, but I'm gonna be a little general. Is it okay to use bacon, jerky, and hot dogs 
in training my dog. So yes, is it okay to use human food when you train your dog? You know, absolutely it is. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I feed my dogs. When you look at the, back, the ingredient list on the back label of the food that I feed my dogs, it actually reads like a, like a fine dining restaurant. So what I believe is I believe that dogs should be eating human grade food, okay? So things like bacon, things like turkey, things like hot dogs, yeah, it is safe for you to feed, for you to feed your dog the things. Now, let me give you a little bit of tidbit of knowledge of something that I picked maybe this past year, maybe within the past couple of years, but I think it's beneficial. If you're th if you're if you just got a puppy and you're gonna try to train them to do you know the leash walking, the stays, the coming when called, all these really important things, and you want to start off with treats, that's actually not a good idea. I really believe, and the research is indicating that hey, you should really be starting with their food and throw in intermit, intermit, uh, intermittent treats. So baseline of food, intermittent treats, okay. So that way, there's some novelty in your training program, but you're also making sure that the diet is exactly what you want it to be. Instead of what I've seen happen is that we flood the dog with treats, and then when we go to feed the food that's meant to be very nutritious for them and to help them, they turn their nose up at it, and they don't want anything to do with it. So just really think about that with, with your dog. You want to give human-grade food, but make sure that you're not giving candy to your dog. Okay, don't give you know a ton of hot dogs when and your dog is refusing the, their kibble or their or their canned food. Now, the one safe way to, to really go that really is human food and your dog is going to love it is feeding raw. But you definitely need to understand that there is some complexity in feeding your dog a raw diet. I'm not an authority on that. I know I feed maybe a raw diet maybe once a month, maybe once every couple of months. But you really need to know, really need to know how to feed your dog in a raw diet. But anyway, so it is safe to feed your dog human food, but make sure that you don't overwhelm them with treats and human uh, and the treat kind of human food, and that they're ignoring the main source of their nutrition, which is a very very important thing. All right, so I see I've got some, I've got a question up on the screen, and so hey Bobby. Thanks so much for joining in tonight. And hey guys, really appreciate each and every one of y'all that's joining in tonight. Uh, love you guys. Hope you and your dogs are doing well. You know we're here for you in any way that I can and I can possibly help. So hey Bobby, thanks again for asking your question. Here is, a, I'm gonna read it back so everybody has context. So hello, I need some guidance. I've been a groomer for 11, uh, for 11 years. Wow, that's a really great career. About four months ago, a stray pup about five months old came into my yard. I have been fostering this pup. She is very frightful of people. She does this rapid fire alert bark to everyone she meets. Many people come up, come through the shop. She is so frightful if the approach to meet her is not super slow. How can I build her confidence? Hey Bobby, you know, this is what a great thing that you're doing to, to help this dog. And I'm just gonna tell you there is a lot of hope for the uh, there is a lot of hope for the dog. Let me just explain one thing that I, that I think is a, is a fun foundational piece of information that I'm constantly preaching to all of my clients. I'm constantly preaching it to you guys. So here it is. Behaviors are modified by emotional consequences. Let me say that again. Behaviors are modified by emotional consequences. Okay, so you got a two-part picture here, okay? You need to, you need to clinically punish the rate of this rapid fire barking, okay? Now, punishment isn't gonna lead to greater amount of confidence, but what is gonna happen through the punishment of the behavior to tell it to stop the rapid fire barking, it's gonna put the dog in the state of mind that then you can actually build the skill that you want. Okay, so I'm gonna get practical for you. Um, this, this tool right here, this is called a pro slip collar. I actually had these had this made for me. Um, I do sell these, but you can also get these from this company, uh, the uh, Lone Wolf Pet Products. They're one of our one of our vendors. Uh, they make great quality leashes. But uh, the Pro Slip Collar is a really nice collar, and it's going to help you to to give some guidance to this dog. What you do with the Pro Slip Collar, and I know you're familiar with this because you kind of use this for your grooming. Slip it on over the top, take it to the top of the dog's head, and then you're going to take this piece of leather here. And I want you to slide it down 
until it locks against the metal ring right there, Bobby. Okay. So you need to stage some people meeting the dog. You need to already have this on the dog. You can either have your hand on the short piece of the leash or you can attach a longer leash there. At the moment that the dog begins the rapid fire barking, I don't want you to talk. Be very, very quiet when you're doing that. Don't give any voice commands in the beginning. And I want you to put some pressure down the leash, okay? Depending on how long the dog has been doing this, it's going to take some patience for the dog to actually go from this tantruming kind of state of mind. You know, it's very anxious and nervous and afraid. And you're going to use the leash pressure to begin to tell the dog's mind you can't go there. Once you can visit, once you can ascertain that the dog is starting to relax, then the leash pressure needs to go away. At that moment, I want you to look down at the dog's body and I want you to place your hand on the shoulder, on the withers of the dog. I don't want you to pet, I want you to put your hand there. If the muscles are still tight, don't start petting yet. Just kind of have the person maybe a, an arm's length, a couple of arm's length away, start having a conversation with the person. But as, as the dog starts coming back up, I want you to bring the pressure of the leash back up. As the dog calms down, I want you to bring it down. If you ever, you know, if you ever, when you put your hand on the dog's shoulder, you feel that the muscles are actually beginning to relax, then I want you to start a slow kind of rhythmic pet across the dog's back while you talk. The most difficult part here is going to be to be quiet during the excitement and the de-escalation of this behavior. Now, this shouldn't come as a surprise to you. This is a habit for this dog. If it's doing it, this is its defense mechanism and you need to change its mind. It's gonna take a ton of repetition and several weeks for you to be able to achieve success. And the big thing here is that you're gonna to have to be very consistent about it. You can't really have a lot of surprise people coming in and not modifying the behavior when that happens to be able to achieve success. So, hey, Bobby, I hope that's helpful. Hey, I would let, you know, hit us back up in a week. Let me know how things are going because I'm really curious to see how that does for the dog. I use this method all the time. It's very successful. And since you're a professional, I know you've been doing this for a while. You know how to deal with dogs. Your patience is going to have to be up there as you're deploying this technique for the dog to be able to get it. So, hey, and if for any of you guys that are kind of struggling, I've got some questions here about whiny you know, bratty dogs that are kind of doing this excitement behavior, the first thing that you got to do for any of these guys is to begin to bring the energy level down. Because if you don't, if you don't bring the energy level down in the dog and you're just yelling and your leash is popping and it's doing all sorts of crazy things, the energy level is going to go up and you're going to get more of that bad behavior. And the other thing is, is if you're petting that dog, telling them, hey, it's going to be okay. No, you need to tell them, chill out. I've got your back. Nothing's going to happen to you. You can rest in my strength, but you're going to have to stop this barking. And as you go through that process, you're going to see the dog really begin to really begin to grow. All right. Well, hey, Bobby, hope that helps. Thanks so much for the question. Really, really appreciate you. All right, guys. So what's next? So how do I get my dog to stop licking with only positive reinforcement and negative punishment? So dogs that lick a lot, okay, it's kind of an obsessive thing. And what I'll tell people, it's kind of like me right now when I'm sitting, my legs are crossed, my feet are actually crossed at the ankles underneath me. I wasn't actually aware that I was doing that. And these dogs licking, they're not aware that they're doing that. You have to actually bring awareness to the behavior. But I want to answer this question because I think that it's uh, I think that it's useful. So how do you change a dog's behavior that's licking too much only using positive reinforcement which means giving them reward and negative punishment which means withholding reward. Well, you are still going to need a leash and any time that the dog begins the any time the dog begins to uh, to lick you're going to have to separate the dog from the target thing that it's licking. You're not going to actually correct the dog, but you're going to physically block the dog from getting the thing that it wants. Okay, That is a form of negative punishment because you're removing the source of the thing that the dog wants to do. 
once the dog actually becomes calm and stops the licking for at least three seconds, then you actually need to begin to reinforce. But you need to be real careful here. I absolutely would not reward the dog with food for to stop a licking behavior. And here's why. If your dog if your dog's licking, which is a food oriented uh, behavior, and you reinforce it with food, it's going to contradict in the dog's mind and tell it to lick more. So when you're using positive reinforcement and negative punishment to stop licking, the only forms of reward that you can use is that you can use petting, you can use praise, and if the dog has any toy drive, you could also use the toy. But I would really recommend the petting and the praise and the blocking the dog from being able to lick the thing that they want, okay? A leash will be very important to that. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I wouldn't go about doing it this way. The degree of patience that you're going to have to have to, to make this particular protocol work, it's a lot. There's a lot of patience involved, and quite frankly, if, if, if you're trying to solve a problem behavior, you don't have weeks to modify it. You probably have two or three days to begin to change this behavior so you can move on to the things that are really important. So I like positive reinforcement. I love it. Negative, negative punishment. I love it. But if a dog is incessantly licking, I'm probably going to use something that's going to tell them, hey, you can't lick anymore. You're going to have to calm yourself down and then you can you can begin to reinforce be very careful if you see any of that licking behavior about bringing your food in at that time well hey judy see that you got a question let me go ahead and go over that for you okay can you recommend a specific type of food to help a german shepherd skin allergies here's what i'll tell you judy and i've got a lot of it i've got a lot of experience with this okay so the first thing that i ever try to do to stop any kind of itching is i up the uh, op up the omega-3 uh, fatty acids, okay? Specifically, the one that I'm after is DHA, but I'm also, also after EPA. I know there's kind of all these chemical names, but let me just tell you what you can do. The first thing that I would do in the dog's food is I would actually start trying to get as much fish oils into the dog's food. The second thing that I would eliminate out of the dog's food is any kind of grain, definitely if there's any corn in there. I'd also take out any kind of food coloring that is in the dog's food. And then the next thing that I do, just depending on the dog, is I may also eliminate chicken, okay, as a source of protein. Now, there's a bunch of fantastic foods out there. I'm going to name some of the ones that I use, but you can also head to any of the local pet stores like Pet Ranch uh, in Kingwood. They do a great job. They have a huge selection of food. Uh, there's also Fur Babies in Kingwood, and there's also uh, uh, Natural Paws there in Kingwood. Any of those stores are going to do a great job. Um, but here's the foods that I uh, that I feed my dog, okay? Uh, the, first, uh, the first brand is called Origin, and that's spelled O-R-I-J-E-N. Another brand uh, that's made by the same company is called Acana, and I, I believe that's spelled A-C-A-N-A. -A. There's several other ones, okay? Uh, another food that we use is Taste of the Wild. This is a really good food. And then we also use uh, From, which is spelled F-R-O-M-M. -M. Um, and then one, I actually have Fritz on one right now. I have Fritz on a food uh, by the brand name Zignature, and I think that's Z-I-G-N-A-T-U-R-E, Zig Nature. He's actually on a goat formula right now. But again, just to kind of make con kind of condense this for you, um, one, I would make sure that there's high amounts of fish oil, fish oil sardine, and anchovy oil in the dog's diet. That's going to be probably the big one that's going to help the dog's coat the most. The second thing is I'm going to take out any of the grains, especially corn, and then I'm going to try to feed food that's really high, uh, higher in protein, and that the first few ingredients are going to be meat, like Origin, From, Acana, Taste of the Wild, food like that. So hey, hope that's helpful. Hope, hope that's helpful, and it's great to see, uh, great to hear from you. All right, so uh, uh, now I don't want to butcher your name. I don't want to butcher uh, the. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm totally gonna butcher your name, so I'm just gonna skip your name. But I'm gonna read your question. Okay, so I'll just call you Adele. Will that will that work, Adele? Sorry, I sh I should be able to read your name. Okay, so I recently rescued a dog, 
and she is not fully potty trained. She is not crate trained either. I'm working on the crate training, but I'm having issues with the potty train. She freaks out if I leave her on the kennel when we leave to the point of injuring herself. I've been leaving her out, out the crate and just trying to keep her in her team and positive reinforcement for the potty train. So this is a this is a tough one. I've got a dog right now that is actually in the not a personal dog, a client's dog that's actually in the same boat as you are. Okay. So look, you're gonna have to do some place training. Let me let me let me show you what you can do with your crate. Now with your crate, I'm I'm hoping that you have a wider frame crate because it's actually gonna make it easier for you if you use the wireframe crate. So if you've got your wireframe crate, you're gonna collapse the, the back of the crate and then you're gonna put the plastic liner over the back of the crate. The front door is also gonna be, have to be open. So I don't have a crate here to demonstrate it for you, but front door is open, the back side of the crate, you're gonna collapse that down and then that plastic liner that sits in the bottom, you're gonna put that over the top. The other thing that I want you to do is I want you to take a blanket, okay, that, uh, that you don't mind that your dog lying on that's very comfortable, I want you to put that inside the crate. Now here's the important part that's gonna go a long way to helping you with the crate training that then will help you with the potty training. Okay, so you're gonna want a, a leash, okay? Uh, we, use, we use these kinds of leashes. This is called the Pro Slip Collar. I use, I use this quite a bit. Um, this is the bigger version of it. This is a slip leash, as you can see there. Really kind of a long uh, four, four to six foot leash. But what happens is if your dog wears it like a collar. So what you're gonna do with the, what you're gonna do with the, the crate that you set up with the back down, the blanket, the front door open, you're gonna use the leash to put the dog inside the crate with the back door open. As soon as your dog gets inside the crate, which you're gonna use, you're gonna use the leash to put the dog in there, I want you to relax the leash if the dog has all four paws inside the crate. Now, your dog's gonna come right out. I want the dog to do that. When the dog comes right back out, you're gonna use your leash again, and you're gonna put your dog back in there. And I want you to do this for as long as it takes. It may take five minutes, it may take you half an hour, it's hard to know without me seeing the dog, until your dog actually chooses to lie down inside the crate. The moment that you see your dog actually stay inside the crate and lie down, I want you to bring the dog's meal. I want you to bring the dog's meal, it should be close by, and begin to feed the dog sitting on the floor, feeding the dog for being inside the crate, showing them how wonderful it is. At any point, if they step out of the crate with the, the, the back down and the door open, you're gonna put them back in there. You're gonna wait for them to lie down again. You're gonna have to do that. You're gonna have to really exercise some patience, okay? That's the first step. Once they actually kind of like being in the crate, you're gonna be able to use that to teach them how to hold it. Now, I'm gonna help you on the other side, on the potty training. One, do you have food and water down on the floor? If you do, get rid of that today. Do not have food and water on the floor uh, at any time because that's what's driving the process and it's gonna make it so difficult for you to be able to time the dog uh, actually using the restroom where you want it to go if you're if you're constantly entitling the dog to that. I want you to be able to give your dog as much food and water as they want, but if you just leave it out, they're not gonna do, they're, not, they're gonna be irresponsible for it and you're kind of in a tough predicament. Look, this is not an easy thing to do, which I just described. It is doable and people do it all the time. If you really need some help with this, I'd be happy to come out, show you how to get it done, how to get it started and give you a head start on fixing this particular problem. Hey, so hey, thanks so much for the question. Really, really appreciate you. Well guys, we're doing pretty well. What time is it? All right, so I've uh, got three of my, uh, four of my own questions. Several of y'all's really appreciate, really appreciate all those. Hey, if you guys are just joining in, um, hey, hit that share button for me. You don't know what it means to me whenever you guys, uh, when you guys share my content, share these live streams, okay? But hey, if you've been following my page for a while, okay, here's something else, okay? You can actually go on the Facebook, you could actually go on the Facebook page and you're gonna see on your phone and you're gonna see right next to where it says that you like my page, you're gonna see a little icon that says following. 
If you're really enjoying this content, go to that following icon and hit see first. Now I promise you we're not going to give you we're not going to give you a whole bunch of silly things. We're going to give you meaningful dog training advice on a daily basis. My goal, we're busting our tails to do this. My goal is to put out five pieces of useful content for you guys every day for free because I just really believe in helping you guys raise the best dogs possible, okay? If you've trained with us, if you're thinking about training with us, you know, the, I have over a decade of experience at this. Like, I'm not trying to brag or anything like that, but this is what I do. I love to help you. I love to help your dog. Take advantage of all these free resources that we're, that we're giving away here on Facebook, and I know that it can only help. And then whenever you have a question, please come to our live show, ask these questions. If you have, uh, if you have an Echo device from Amazon, heck, you can even ask me questions there. We've got some cool things coming up in the future that you're going to be able to do with that. Uh, you know, I'm working really hard. Ask anybody that knows me how hard I'm working right now. Working really hard to bring you guys some amazing, amazing content, okay? And some really relevant dog training advice. But hey, if you need help, this is what I'm here for. Please use those resources now. Go hit that share button. Make sure you follow our page. Okay, so, all right, here's something a little bit more lighthearted. I like these kinds of questions too. How do you actually get your dog to roll over? I am gonna do a lot, uh, do another one of these Q and A's where I'm gonna have one of my dogs and all these kind of practical things where you're asking a question like, hey, how do you do, how do you teach your dog this? How do you teach your dog that? How do you teach this? I'm actually going to show you how do you teach anything in the world. I'm gonna be using Gabby as my, as my dog, but I can't wait to do that live stream. We're, we're, I'm thinking about doing it sometime this month, maybe in December, okay? So how do you teach your dog to roll over? Here's what I do, okay? I get the dog into a down. I bring food to their mouth, but I have my hand actually locked up. Uh, well, hand, my hand locked up with all the food in there, and I have it smashed up against the dog's nose. So I smash the food up against the dog's nose. The dog is trying to get. This dog is trying to get in there, and then what I try to do is I use my hand. I go to their hip, and I begin to put some pressure on their hip as I roll their nose over. As they start to roll a little bit, I'll dispense a little bit of the food, and then I do it again, and then I do it again, and then I do it again. And I had this post earlier this week. I just keep doing it until it gets easy. Heck, your dog might get it in five reps. I know my dogs, they don't like to do this trick. It probably would take me 50 reps to, to show them how to roll over and maybe get five or six in a row. But really, patience is the answer to getting your dog how to do this. You don't really need a leash, but I do recommend using your hand and a food lure and beginning to manipulate the dog through the movement. Now, I'll give you one piece of advice. Once your dog has rolled over the entire, like all the degrees, at 180 degree turn on the floor, when you get your dog to flip over to the other side, put a large substantial reward there. That's really where you wanna put the biggest reward is on the far side of the roll for the dog to be like, oh, that's where the big source of reward is. And that's gonna make it easier for you to do it. The first couple of sessions when you're teaching any trick, I would recommend leaving out any of the voice commands that we're so prone to give, okay? You can give encouragement and anything like that, but I don't recommend the voice command at the beginning of a trick, just like, you know, rolling over. Okay, what's next? Oh, hey, I'm, I'm glad that you're gonna remove that food and water because that's, you know, that's really gonna help. It, you know, dogs, when, if your dog has like, if, if you had a money tree in the backyard, why would you go to work? You know, you would just you'd stay home, right? Well, your dog with the food and water, it's kind of like, hey, I have a money tree. Everything that I'm doing, I should continue to do that. So the, the food and water on the floor, which is something that I do for my trained dogs, but something that I don't do for my untrained dogs, is such a powerful thing for changing their behavior by taking control of that stuff. Okay, so the next question, how do I get my dog to go to sleep at night? Oh, there we go, man. Here we go, one more time. So how do you get your dog to go to sleep at night? Well, here's the answer, okay? You know, you gotta wear them out. But it doesn't mean taking your six-month-old puppy for a two-mile run 
If that's you, quit doing that. Don't run your six month old puppy, but you gotta physically and mentally wear your dog out if you want them to go the whole night um, without barking. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do raising my dogs. Um, when I, we get a puppy, uh, and yes, we've talked about getting one next year, maybe, right? So um, when we get a puppy, I, for those first few months, from eight weeks to about eight months, and it's give or take, right? If they're whining at night, I'm getting up. I'm getting up. I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to take you to the restroom and you know, see, see what's going on with you, okay? So during that time period, I have a lot of grace for the dogs. I'm just going to get up for them because I believe that they, they deserve that. They deserve the, the opportunity to, to learn about that. But look, I still need to sleep. You know, we see a lot of clients. I know we all have jobs. We have to perform there. So what I do is I really kind of set myself up for success. I really work my dogs, their minds and their bodies in appropriate ways, the hours leading up to it. Now, if I don't want any potty accidents and you're going to go to, you're, you're going to, go to sleep or put the dog in its crate at 9 p.m., heck, you might be done feeding at 6. You might be done giving water at about 6.30 or 7. Now, some people think that's kind of a long time. And I'll just tell you this. The consequence of your dog being thirsty overnight, you know, I might, get, I might catch some flack for this, but it's not that big a deal. The dog will wake up in the morning. It'll drink its water. And then you can begin to control and teach your dog uh, teach your dog where to potty. So teaching your dog to sleep at night, to stay asleep at night, is about wearing them out in the hours coming up, coming up to that and stimulating their mind with games and with training. Um, and then also, you know, playing with them. You know, playing tug, playing fetch, uh, playing mental games. Those are the things that are actually going to put your puppy uh, to sleep. Now, some people, you know, will put food inside the crate to get the dog in there, yeah, that's great, but it's not gonna get the dog to necessarily fall asleep. Here's one thing that I do with adult dogs, uh, that it's kind of a recommendation that none of us as adults should be doing this. You know, if you eat, if you eat a hamburger at 9 p.m. at night and then you're gonna go to sleep at 10, that's not such a great idea, right? So I tend to feed my dogs uh, later on in the evening and when I do that, uh, that actually puts them to sleep pretty quickly. You know, it works for us. I don't really recommend that for everybody, but it's not such a bad thing to be able to go and do that. But getting your dog to sleep at night is really about that mental and physical stimulation, the hours leading up to it, and making sure that you don't give food uh, too late to those small puppies uh, because they are, they're not, they're not going to be able to hold it the way that an adult dog can. All right. Let's see. Let's find a question that I like. So here's one. Okay. So the question is, hey, Maria, good to see you. All right. So uh, what should I teach a dog that is only an outdoor pet? Man, I was really waiting to go over this one. So how do we actually differentiate between what an indoor pet is and an outdoor pet? Now, like, I get it. I get it. If you have dogs that are outdoor I understand that, but what's the first thing that you should teach the dog? I don't think that there's necessarily a qualifier for what you should teach an indoor dog versus an outdoor dog. Like every dog should learn how to stay where you ask them to. Every dog should learn how to walk nicely on a leash and each and every dog should learn how to come to you. What I have seen in the dogs that are these outside dogs when we come to train them is that the moment that we open the door, I'm getting clawed to death by these dogs are just coming down and clawing me and raking me with their nails. And that's just because they're just so excited to see a human. They're like, oh my God, the humans are finally here. We're going to do something. And so they start jumping on us and then that's going to lead us to getting upset. So I think the first thing that I would want to teach my dog is how to be calm and how, how, how much I value them, but how much that they should also respect me. So opening that back door and getting assaulted by your jumping dog is no way to do that. And you're likely only going to yell because, heck, everybody knows this, nails raking across your body, they suck. It hurts. Nobody, nobody wants that. So instead of thinking about being an outdoor dog or an indoor dog, think about like, hey, how do I teach my dog to actually be a calm dog or teach my dog how to focus with their excitement? You know, those are better goals uh, to have versus what's the first thing that I should teach an, an, outdoor, an outdoor dog. But look, I get it. Sometimes you have to have dogs outdoors, um, but I would recommend to anybody 
that if you believe that a, a dog should only be outdoors because they're never going to be able to be behaved inside your home, um, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that it's very, very possible to live very well with not only the smallest, but the largest of dogs inside your home. And dogs are very smart. They learn what you teach them. So there's my two cents on that. What do you guys think about that? If you have, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a preference? Do you think your dog should be inside or outside? I'm curious to hear what you, what you guys think. Is every like anybody that's watching this? Are your dogs, are your dogs inside the house? Are, are your dogs inside the house overnight? Yeah, I'd like to know. Just you know, are are they inside or outside of overnight? I'm really curious. Oh, look. Having dogs, uh, let me go back to your question for a sec. Introducing new dogs, it, look, I'll, I'll give you the real simple answer, but I'll give you some particulars. The simple answer is that every dog that's inside my home has to be calm. So when I bring new dogs in, I teach my other dogs to be calm around them. The easiest way to do that is through the place training. I tell all my dogs to go to their place. They're actually in a, you know, in a kind of calm state of mind. And then I, in, I bring the other dog in. The other dog might actually be excited. And if it's excited, I might actually get my other dogs out of the room for maybe that first day or so, teach that dog where I want them to be. And then once the dog understands where those boundaries are, then I will bring the other dogs into the room. Now, if all the dogs are actually calm on their beds, they're kind of half sleeping and half dozing off there, then ask them to come off. And if the you know if they were calm and then you ask them to come off and they were truly calm, you're not going to see a lot of escalation unless you have a really, really bad apple in the group. But that's not likely to happen. But if your dog is real, real excited, it's tense, it's on its place, it's staring down the other dog, and your dog is staring right back and you say that they're calm, but they're really locked into each other and you ask them to come off, well... Get ready for a WrestleMania because that's what's going to happen next, okay? The big thing is, is that dogs, you know, the, the thing that's going to predict if your dogs are going to do the things that you don't want them to do is the excitement. If your dog is excited, that's always what's going to lead it to do all the, the bad stuff that we don't. But if the dogs are calm and they understand how to respect the human and the human knows how to calm them, then you can actually have a ton of success with, with, you know, with dogs. It's hard to have two excited dogs side by side and focused. It takes years of training to be, to be able to do that, okay? But, but, okay, calm dogs are really easy to get along. Now, one more tidbit, okay? The other tidbit is if your dogs, okay, already know how to walk nicely on a leash, Showing the foster dog how to walk on a short and slack leash together in a pack, that can be really beneficial. So I'm getting visited by one of my dogs right now. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's time for her to eat her food. She's, we still got a few more minutes. But hey, that's how I'd go about it. Uh, I, and I, I hope that's helpful for you. I'd love to know uh, if that works. But calming the dogs, being real patient telling them specifically where you want them to be and holding them accountable for that is definitely the, the answer to, to this problem. Okay. So yeah, how do, I, uh, how do I resolve food aggression with my four-month-old puppy? The simplest way, if like any, any kind of young dog is showing resource guarding, it's to take those resources away and begin to show the dog that, hey, I'm in control of this stuff. I'm going to give it to you, and you're going to have to trust me for it. Now, look, if you have a, like a four-month-old puppy, yes, they got those razor-sharp teeth, but they probably don't have real human aggression at that point. So, you know, taking your treat pouch, having the food in there, and then starting to feed the dog one piece at a time when you have this kind of food-aggressive puppy, doing that, doing that for, for several weeks is going to help them to understand how to trust you. But, look, if you're struggling with this, a leash goes a long way. Having the leash on the dog when you're going to go through an exercise of feeding a resource guarding animal and that you're going to feed it its food, not a bad idea to have the to have a leash on the dog. But hand feeding hand feeding a four month old puppy with a leash on with your treat pouch and you're feeding them their kibble, I think that's going to do really great for you um, and really going to be able to help the dog change its mind about how it, how it sees you as like, hey, you're the provider 
of the food. Dogs are very, very transactional. If you put the bowl of food down, they don't see that it comes from you. They only really see that the food comes from you when you're individually giving them each piece. You're associating your voice, you're associating your petting with that. One thing I would be very careful with if you show, have a puppy that's showing its teeth and growling and resource guarding as you're feeding them, you know, as you feed, don't be petting them at the same time because that's very likely likely to get you a nap. But if that's going to happen, wear a hoodie, get some gloves that are a little bit thicker on, so that way the dog can't really injure you and begin to work through this problem with the dog. But hey, if this is you, if you've got a puppy that's showing you some aggressive tendencies with your food, we'd love to be able to help. I'm really good at working with with very young dogs and teaching them how you know, teaching them the ropes, teaching them how to uh, teaching them how to. Uh, to interact with humans well. Hi, right, Coral, I got another question from you. Uh, what if your, your dog resource guards a family member? Hey, you know, that's the thing, man. Well, a lot of times with these resource guarding, you know, dogs resource guarding humans is that the human is allowing it. You, you know, I, I just really feel like that. Like if, if somebody, if, if another human gets, cl- like another human family member gets close to another family member and then the dog begins to growl, What probably led up to that point is the dog is on the sofa and being caressed by that person. You know, there's a bunch of positive reinforcement and the dog's state of mind is, hey, I own this individual right here. So the, you know, it's a dangerous situation. One, I I would, you know, if, if if that's the situation that's going on, that's a pretty common one too. If that's the situation that's going on, the dog has lost the, lost the ability to be on the couch with a human. The, the bad part about this is a lot of times when a, when a dog is resource guarding a human, is the human, is the human that's being resource guarded is, is using the dog to reward themselves because it feels good to stroke the dog. You're actually gonna have to break that bond some and teach that dog that, hey, you, you don't own that human. We're gonna separate you from that human we're going to use a leash. We may actually have to use a remote collar as well to teach you that you have to respect all the humans. All the humans should be here, and then the dogs should be here. And I personally, when the way that we raise our dogs, all of our dogs are on the same level, and all of the humans are on the same level. It's never going to exactly work out that way, but if you try to kind of keep that in mind that it's humans and dogs, that the dogs have to respect the humans, that the humans have to love and respect the dogs, then you're gonna see a lot of growth there. But hey, if a dog is resource guarding a family member, that dog wears a leash, probably needs to wear a muzzle, and then every time that they start to disrespect another human, both humans need to tell that dog, we are not okay with you treating us that way, and you're never allowed to do that again, and here's why. And the dog shouldn't like what happens next, should be humane, but it should be firm to be clear to the dog that don't you don't get to treat us like that. All right, so I'm gonna go over one more question and then we're gonna wrap up, guys. So I covered that one. Yeah, here's one that I want, okay. So when should I tell my puppy that has been, my, when should I tell my four month old puppy who has been barking for two months to stop? Like I like to be real patient with puppies that are barking. Um, I like to give them a lot of time to be able to work out of it. I use a lot of positive reinforcement when they're actually being quiet. I use a lot of negative punishment. That means ignoring them, not giving any, any food until they calm down. I do a lot of that, but look, this is a situation that I've run into, probably run into it maybe about three or four times a year, that you've got this puppy, they're barking their heads off, you've worn them out, you've, you've done everything that I've asked you to do, and the, and the puppy is cost, making you be late to work, your performance is going down, you're not able to sleep at night because this dog will not stop barking. If that's you and you've had all the patience in the world, it's time to use a remote collar or a bark collar to tell the dog to be quiet. And yes, it's humane to do this, okay? Look, it's important that we all be able to do our jobs and be able to enjoy, you know, enjoy our pets, but when our pets' behaviors get out of hand, they're really exceeded and it's really you know, impacting our ability to work, you gotta tell your dog to be quiet. And a bark collar is not gonna physically injure your dog. It should be uncomfortable because you know, discomfort modifies behaviors. And then as your dog actually learns that we're not gonna allow you to bark excessively, you can go back to the business of actually rewarding your dog. But like, just 
you know, you shouldn't put a bark collar on a puppy just because it barks a couple of times. If this is a, a reoccurring problem that's going on for weeks and months on end, okay, then it's probably time to be able to go and do something like that. Well, guys, um, you know, with the time change, I've been, I've been still taking advantage of waking up the time that my body is, is used to, but um, I'm pretty tuckered out. I'm pretty tuckered out, so we're going to go ahead, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. But I wanted to see something real quick. Yeah, and I wanted to end with this right here. So guys, hey, appreciate each and every one of y'all. Hope you guys are having a fantastic week. And I love y'all.